Good evening, everybody. We are live with 17 Grand Slam champion Gigi Fernandez. Uh, Gigi, how are you doing tonight? Great. Yeah. Well, Can't wait. Thing, We're, I we, miss we, our we, Grand Slam calls of the month the last few months. I'm glad this came up. Yeah, yeah. Well, we got we got to get back on that. I know we've both been extremely busy. Uh, yeah. We see Tom Nordstrom saying hello to Pete and Gigi. Tom's on a lot of our Grand Slam calls of the month. Yeah, so it's I remember great Tom. To see him. And Robin from Raleigh is on. And so, yeah, you guys, as you come on in, I love it when people come in and say where they are from. Um, tonight, what we're going to go through is we're going to go through Gigi Fernandez, how to dissect your own game for constant improvement. So we came up with that title together. And the reason why we did is because when you watch champions become champions, they just don't stay the same player to stay champions. They've got to get better every single year as long as they're the champ, right? So so how does that work, Gigi? How do you get to be the champion? And then how do you start to notice like, oh, darn, I got to add this to my game or I'm not going to be a champ next year? Yeah, so there's really a lot of analysis that goes on or in reflection. Um meeting with your coaches, because sometimes when you're playing, it'd be great if you have someone watching your matches, because you don't really always know or rarely know what goes on in a match from the sort of 30,000 foot level, right? <clears throat> we get so caught up when we're playing a match with winning and losing that sometimes it's hard to know like what stroke was working, what stroke wasn't working. So I always relied on my coaches after matches to kind of help me decide what needed tweaking. But before I got to the point where I was a professional player, then I had to go stroke by stroke and develop each stroke to the point where I felt it could hold up under pressure, right? So, I mean, there's no mystery here in that repetition is sort of the name of the game. Like the more you hit your forehand the same way over and over again, the more consistent it's going to be under pressure. So I, I, you know, nowadays there's of course the open stance forehand and the closed stance forehand. When I started playing, the open stance forehand was not around. It it came to around my what while I was already on tour, so I had to develop the open stance forehand. But um, Mariana Silvestri de Argentina, hola. Um, but if you um, if you have one, if you have two forehand, okay, let's just say you have one forehand. You have open stance forehand, and that's it then it's you just have to go and repeat that, get a ball machine, love the ball machine, and just hit thousands and thousands of balls. And if you can, if you can as much as possible have the same footwork, the same setup, the same swing path, the same follow through, the same finish, and you can repeat that time after time after time, then the work that you do is to get your body in the position so that you're meeting the ball in the same point of contact, right? So the point of contact is going to change because the ball is going to be there. It's going to be here. It's going to be short. It's going to be long, but you have to move your body so that if you do the same swing, then it's in the point of contact that you, from all this practice have determined that it's the one that goes in, you know, 95% of the time. So ball machine uh, video is great. Nowadays, everybody can put their, um, their tennis on, on a video, grab a little iPhone and just set it so you can watch, uh, you know, when I was playing, yeah, when I was playing, we had the big old Sony cams and there was no instant feedback. I had to record something and then go back after the session ended and I would go in to my hotel room or my house where I was living and watch it on TV <laughs> and, uh, then go back and say, okay, that's what I had to work on. So, so I was just sort of start with the forehand and say, okay, cross court forehands, put a target and try to get hit to that target as many times as possible. When you're, when you're practicing to targets, and I think this is something that most players do this really badly, including juniors, um, and something that pros do really well is they always hit the ball to a target. They always have a target in mind where they want the ball to land. You know, start with big targets like – uh, four feet from the baseline and four feet from this from the sideline. If you're hitting cross court rally, four feet is a big space, right? It's almost the size of a human. So start with four feet and then try to get the ball into that target. Now the key to being successful when you're doing target practice is to not miss twice in the same direction, right? So if you're 
consciously practicing and you hit your forehand cross court and you see that goes in the alley and you were trying to hit it in the single sideline, then the next one you aim towards the middle. So you don't miss in the alley twice. And as you become consciously aware of where your balls are going, you learn the skill of making your ball go deeper or making it go a little bit more to the right or a little more to the left. But again, it all starts with having that same swing path. So every time you hit the ball, it's the same. You're not hitting this one time and hit one time and over here one time. You have to try to mechanize as much as possible um, your ground stroke or that specific stroke that you're working on. So that, that gets us started. What do you think of that, Pete? Uh, what I was thinking, I'm like, Gigi is on fire tonight. <laughs> like, we get her an opening and she's like, Whoo! And, uh, and and in that time you did that, we got over 100 people on the call. We have 113 people on the call. We got a ton of people saying hello to Gigi Fernandez tonight, which is great. And what you said, this reminded me of so many things. First of all, it reminded me of one of our Grand Slam calls we had with Jim Courier. And it was, how do you play well under pressure? And he just looked at you and you two kind of looked at each other like you knew exactly what you're going to, what he's going to say. It's like, well, Gigi, you know, you just got to automate. You got to hit a bunch of balls right. and they got to be perfectly hit. And then when you automate that shot, then you can pull it off under pressure. And we actually had a really great call with Jeff Saldenstein on Thursday night, who is also top 100 in the world. And uh, we were talking about mastery and what it takes to achieve mastery and then what it takes to maintain mastery and and what you're talking about is in the beginning uh, achieving mastery all the stuff that when you see people like Gigi she went through all those hard yards probably when she was younger and was one of those hot shots that you're looking at when you're at your club going oh my gosh I wish I could play like that she's putting in all those hard yards and then once she gets to become a pro she probably did things like I watch Emma Raducanu do when I was at the the Cincinnati tournament, she was going to play Serena Williams and it rained. So she came inside Harper's point. She hit one shot for an hour and a half. And it was that short ball. They just fed her a short ball for an hour and a half. And she just clocked it over and over and over again. To a so target. To a target. Ta she had to a target. target in mind. Yeah. And like you said, it was the same exact footwork, same exact swing. Then she put her volley away pretty much the same exact spot. And she did go out the next day and take care of Serena uh, pretty pretty handily. But, um, you know, that's what's so interesting is I, I think a lot of players who are watching this, they're, they're working really hard. They're working harder than most club players, I'd say. I mean, if you're on here watching this call, there's another level of dedication that you have that a lot of people at your club don't have. But I think, too, they get upset at themselves that they're not able to go up and, and hit a forehand in the midcourt the way you can or the way Emma can. Uh, and that they miss those, but I don't think they're respecting that first you got to make sure that it's like a fine oiled machine before you can even do it under pressure. And then once you get it, then you got to keep that thing just revved up. So when you see the ball, you're just like, bam, and it's over. Right. Right. Absolutely. And first it happens in practice, like, and practicing with intensity is probably the difference between pros and juniors and recreational players. Like when you watch the pros practice, they have match intensity. We have, you know, when I was playing, I had match intensity of practice. So, so I try to be as intense and as um, dedicated to practices as I was to matches. Um, oh, hi, Roberta. You see oh that? Oh, the whole team. team is watching. That is so cool. Robbie, Robbie does yoga for tennis at my camps. He's awesome. Oh, that's um, great. So, um, so yeah, so it's, the, it's having the intention in practice. So, so you're not just kind of, you know, messing around and, you know, being okay if you miss three in a row. Like, really, if you want to get to that level as much as possible, focus for, you know, it might be hard at first to focus for an hour of practice, but take it a little chunks at a time. So say, okay, turn your clock on. For five minutes, I'm going to hit cross court forehands and I'm going to focus. I'm not going to, my mind's not going to go somewhere else to the grocery list and I got to pick up the kids and I'm just going to focus for five minutes on hitting these cross court forehands and really feel it. Feel feel your shot like as much as you can. And ideally, you're videoing it, right? Um, or you have a coach helping you, but even if you don't, the video can can do it for you. Um, and then repeat it over, over and over again. And there's so many shots that that's just, we just talked about the forehand, right? But there's, you need you do this for every shot, right? So I had a one-handed backhand, so I would I would just have balls fed, and I would just rip four hundred, uh, you know, a thousand one-handed backhands. 
<laughs> fed balls are great, hand tossed balls, um, because those are dead, we call called dead, dead feeds, like the balls have no pace on them, so you have to generate your own pace. Um, and that's a great way to work on technique because you have time, the ball's not coming to you. Um, <clears throat> so do that with, the, with your backhand. If it's a two-handed backhand, then you work on your cross court, work on your down the line. Um, if you have a slice backhand, then you have to, same thing, work on your slice backhand, try to get, try to as much as possible, get the point of contact in the same place. And that's working, you have to work, you have to move your feet to get the ball so you're in the same point of contact every time you hit the ball. You know, like golfers have it easy because the ball's not moving, right? <laughs> <laughs> James sitting over there. Um, so this ball is moving. So you have to do the moving yourself so that you can, as much as possible, hit the ball the same way, um, the same time. Yeah. You mentioned something that's very interesting. You talked about the hand feed, you know, getting the ball hand fed. Then you talked about, you know, hitting cross court for five minutes. And I've been talking more and more about, I'm really trying to, because everybody wants to play like they practice. Um, it's one of the things that I, I ask people, what do you think is holding you back from getting to the next level when I was preparing for Tennis Con 6? And one of them was, I don't play like I practice. I, I, I practice great, then I don't play so great. And what's the answer? And you're kind of giving the answer. You're talking about all this repetition making sure it's perfected. And, and I feel like you have a chance to do that in what I'd call a closed environment, your, right. your shadow strokes, your hand feeds, a coach feeding you off the racket. But then if you don't also then keep building on that and then you get in your cross court rallies and then you get into let's play some points and then, you know, let's put some real pressure on this. If you don't do that all right. in your practices, then when you got you play a match, if you're just like, you you play bad and you're like oh I serve terrible and you just go to the bat to, to your basket and serve a bunch of balls you know your serve is probably still going to fall apart in the next match because you don't get to the serve a, a, a million balls in a row when you play a match that that's that's right. giving you an opportunity to get it in a rhythm and and get your technique going but you've always you've also got to layer it in, in yeah. into where all of a sudden the, the pressure builds right and then the stuff gets more challenging right so two things about that. Um, the first is, you know, when you're hitting with a pro or with a hand toss ball or, or a ball machine, the balls are coming to you, right? So be careful feeling confident that you've mastered a shot because you're hitting great with a pro. Um, the best way to know if you're hitting great at something is to play with somebody at the level below you. Most people play worse when they're playing people a level below them. So if you're 4 0, Go find some three fives and beat them badly, right? And practice those shots with, with those three fives and um, and see how how you do when the pressure's on you, right? So that's when you, if you're four, you're supposed to be a three five, right? So um, so try that. And and they're not giving you as good a ball, right? So the balls are coming as pretty or as, you know, perfectly hit, like sometimes pros um sin from giving you too much of the perfect ball right so you have to move to the ball in a match and then the other the other thing i wanted to talk about was how to introduce a shot a new shot to a match so so you're working you've been working on your slice backhand say um you know and you've worked on it for a couple months you, you are you're still having your 200 backhand that's solid and you want to bring the slice backhand into a match because you know, you're playing someone who doesn't like low balls or super tall doesn't like low balls so how do you how do you do that? Like you've only ever used it in matches, and now you have to bring the shot that you've never hit in a match to a match. So when I was working on a shot, got it, Andrea, third time. Yes, thank you, Andrea Rose is here. <laughs> I, <laughs> I see you. <laughs> Persistence pays sometimes. Go on. Okay, go so ahead. Um, so um, how you introduce a shot to a match is okay. You say I'm I've been working on the shot. So sometime in this set, I'm going to try the shot once. All right, so you're just going to do it one time, the first time you introduce a shot to a match. To a match. Try it one time. You may win the point, you may lose point. Um, and it's fine whether you win or lose it. You, what you're looking for is the execution of the shot, right? So if it works, then you say, okay, I'm going to try it. Maybe the next game I'll try it again. Or maybe I'll try it two times, right? And then over time, you say, okay, now, that, now I'm going to try it five times in this set. And over, and then if you do it this way, kind of progressively, then you'll get to the point where you're like, oh my God, I'm hitting this shot all the time and I'm making it all the time. Um, so that's kind of how you introduce it. You don't just work on a shot and then hope it works at a match. 
it's not going to happen right away. Like you have to, it has to be like baby steps um, that lead into something working under pressure. I, I love that. And, and I think that that is something that players and coaches get wrong is you'll watch a video. Like sometimes I kind of go, oh no, you know, like it's really not supposed to work like that. People will tell me if they meet me in person, oh, I watched the video and it was a great video you made. Then I went out and I served awesome the next day. I'm like, yeah, that's kind of like a fluke thing. I, you know, you got to work at that serve to really make it work for you every match. Uh, you know, you might get inspired, but it, it's probably a little bit of fool's gold. And I love how you said that you want to introduce it. And, and I totally agree with you. I, I think also, like you said, the more you're working on something new, that's, I think you really got to work on that the most in enclosed environment because you want to mm -hmm. polish it like a diamond and make it look perfect and make sure that you have all the fundamentals down before you challenge it. And then you eventually put it into a match. And the more you open up practice, you know, you, you, you have your forehand looking really good because your coach is feeding you the ball underhand and they're feeding you off the racket. And then you go to round and you play a match and then your forehand falls apart. Don't think that, well, oh no, you're really not getting better because my forehand absolutely stunk in the match and I guess I'm not getting better. It's the more things open up with something new, it is going right. to fall apart because you're like developing a product that you want to sell in a store and you right. can't just bring it out to market. You've got to test it just like Gigi's saying. And um, I mean, I, I remember even one time when I was coaching, I was a young coach and I felt so bad for this kid. This kid did not have a really good second serve technique. He was developing it. And as I remember the coach yelled at him. He's like, if you don't hit your second serve the way I told you to, the entire match, I'm pulling you off the court. Oh. Like, uh, yeah. Yeah. And I was, yeah, yeah, we were like he's playing, not trying, right? Yeah, we were playing like inner club and the kid's like 12, you know, and it's like it was oh. painful because like, okay, now – is double faulting 30 times really going to build your confidence and, and get you inspired to keep working on it? So yeah. I, I love the way that you said, test it, see how it works. If it does good, then try it again. Then add it three times the next match. That's great. Yeah. So then the other, the other thing that's important to talk about when you're trying to improve your game is we have to talk about strengths and weaknesses, right? Everybody has strengths. Everybody has weaknesses. And sometimes when you're improving, you get really caught up with making your, weaknesses better and you forget your strengths right so so i would say you know when i was practicing i would spend when i was developing okay you know when i was probably from my 20s and on from my, my in all my 20s until i got to 30 um and 30 was significant because when i turned 30 i said to my coach i think um this is it like i think this is my level like i don't th feel like i need to improve anything my game is what my game is, and, I, and I'm going to keep this game until I retire. I wasn't trying to add a shot or improve a shot, or I felt everything was solid, everything was what, where it needed to be. But that, that was still when I was 30, right? And I've been number one in the world for you know eight years. Um, so while I was number one in the world, I, I still was trying to make my, weak, my weaknesses turn them into a strength. But without forgetting that you still – your strengths still have to be solid, right? So, so when I was developing, the percentage of time that I spent training my weaknesses and my strengths was 75, 25, where I was spending 75% of the time training my weaknesses and then 25% of the time working on my strengths. And then once it, once it, you know, I got to that 30 year old stage where I was like, okay, now I'm going to just keep this game. Then it got flipped. And then I would work mo more to make my strengths great or keep them where they were and not let them you know drop down and then maybe work a little bit on my weaknesses but um but but that sort of shifted once you once you get the strength right and once and then and then you have to dice like dissect or you have to use that word like your, your entire game like look at your ground strokes look at your volleys you look at your transition shots you look at your uh high volleys half volleys low volleys um stretch volleys uh bodies into your body. I mean, I remember spending weeks and weeks and weeks trying to get away from the volley that came to my body, right? That's a very hard volley to, to hit and you can get lazy and just put your racket there and block it back. Or you can work super hard with your feet and get your foot out of the way so that you take a step back and you're able to turn and step into it. Um, I worked for 
months and months and months on my servant volley footwork. So um, so servant volley footwork. That's something is you know if you're going to serve a volley, your footwork is different if you're serving in volley than if you're serving and staying back. So serve so serve split or run run split and go to a volley. So I would basically do that without the ball coming back. So I would just serve run up the net split and I would try to split before the ball hit the back fence. Right. So I hit my serve. And then before the ball hit the back fence, I needed to have split close to the service line, as close to the service line as possible. Um, and then, so start with that. Now, it, ideally, you have to time the split when the ball crosses the baseline, right? Because that's sort of where the opponent is going to hit the return from, somewhere around the baseline. So see how far in you can get to the net before that ball has hit or crossed the baseline. The further in you get, the better your first volley is going to be, the, or easier the first volley is going to be. If you hit a huge serve, it better be in a good spot because if you hit a huge serve, you don't have a lot of time to get to the, how far can you get? You could probably one or two steps and you're having to split already. That's why in doubles, it's so important to hit like a three quarter pace serve because you have more time to get to the, to the net. So, so again, like take, break it down like that. Take, okay, for the next two weeks, I'm going to work on my split step, you know, and then when you go to practice, just think about your split step for two weeks and try to get that. So it becomes automatic and you're not constantly having to think about it. Wow. That was a lot of information. That was a <laughs> lot of great information. <laughs> no, I love it. And you guys, you guys are killing it. We're up to 177 people. So people are excited to be on here. Uh, we have a couple of questions. Um, this one's pretty good, I think. Do you use key points in your head? Like, Dottie, how's Dottie doing? Um, yeah, so I have what I call trigger words. And trigger words are part of my mental toolkit that's, you know, things that help you under pressure to perform um, and be able to repeat a shot when pressure is at its highest. And for everybody in the world, something happens under pressure on every shot. Like no one's immune, even Roger and Serena and Rafa, and they, they know what's going to go off under pressure. So for example, for me, I knew that under pressure my on my serve, my left arm was going to come down. So I had a trigger word, which was left arm up, high faith. Um, left arm up, right? So if you're thinking left arm up as you're tossing the ball, well, of course you're going to keep your left arm up. But more importantly, because you're thinking left arm up, you can't think, oh, oh darn, I don't want a double fault. Like, right? Mm -hmm. Because yes. you're thinking left arm up. And also because you're thinking left arm up on the first point, the second point, the third point, the tenth point, the match point. When you get to the match point, then that's just another point. It doesn't feel more intimidating or it doesn't feel like it's a bigger point. Um, so keep so 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 use those trigger words and also if you, it keeps you from getting mental on a shot right so if i used to get a little mental on my forehand um and i would decelerate and not you know sort of get a little tight on it so if i ever had a sitter forehand my trigger was accelerate i knew that i needed to accelerate on these balls so again if i'm thinking accelerate i can't think don't choke right because I'm, mm -hmm. I'm thinking oh, i'm just doing what i'm telling myself to do so you definitely have to have and that's kind of more covering the mental side of tennis, but you definitely have to have these um, trigger words that I call in your brain for the majority of your shots. Yeah, I think that's great. And would you find that the accelerate word would kind of coincide with maybe your breathing and your grunt too? To yeah, kind of as I'm hitting, yep. Or, and sometimes, you know, for me, for that specific shot, it was sitters, right? So, the, so I would have a sitter, like kind of make cord and have all this time to think. And I'm just thinking accelerate as I'm going to the ball. I'm supposed to think of thinking don't miss, right? Or whatever. Mm -hmm. Make it. Like making it is a good keyword, but it doesn't help you make it. But if you accelerate or you follow through or you get the point of contact in front, they're all behavioral, right? Or you're um, extending your elbow or that's not a thing. For some people, they didn't have to extend their elbow. Or yeah. if you're you know, snapping your wrist, whatever it is, everybody's got different stroke, right? Everybody's doing something different. So I have a question for you. Uh, Cause it seems like whenever I go to a tournament, I, I rarely leave the tournament without at least seeing it on one court, the coach there with like their little box of balls, feeding up those little meatballs in the short court that people are coming in and creaming <laughs> it. Um, so how much did you work on hitting short balls in your practice and and what did you do? What were your favorite practices to get in the rhythm on executing short balls? So I probably hit that. I tried that shot at nauseum. I was not very good at it. It was not a strength. It was definitely a weakness. 
Um, fortunately, because I, for singles, I needed it, but not much because I served in Bali. So that, for me, that was not a shot that I got a lot because I was just not in the baseline. Um, but when I did get in the baseline and I did get that shot, then I was not good at it. That's why I developed those trigger words, um, the accelerate words specifically to help me with it. Um, but, you know, things that would probably work like what you're referring to more would be like a sitter volley, right? I have mm -hmm. this floater volley. I'm two feet from the net and I need to mm -hmm. crush it and I cannot miss this ball, right? I mean, you miss a sitter volley at any point in a match and you're done. I got the tour on tour because then it becomes mental. The other team knows you choked. And you, you, I mean, there were players on the tour that, that you knew that at some point in this match, they're going to miss the sitter volley. And then oh, wow. once they miss that sitter volley, you've, you've got the match won because then they were going to go on their head. Right. So, so I would work on those and work on those and work on those and work on those. Um, so I could practically hit them with my eyes, eyes closed and just never miss it. Yeah. That's interesting. You said that. I actually made a video a couple of years ago, like, you know, the, the serve plus one is the new serve and volley, you know, when right. you were yep, playing sure serve is. plus one was serve and volley. Serve now volley, it's serve yeah. mid court crush. You mid know. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. This is a little off topic, but I find it interesting. I, I'm interested to get your point of view on it. Uh, what do you think about pronation after contact? Is it, is it a must? Was it something you really thought about? People get really obsessed with this. Pronation. Okay, so I highly recommend that you find or buy or listen to or Google Mark Kovacs Kinetic Serve Chain. Um, he is the expert in talking about the, the serve and um, pronation happens. He explains it beautifully. I'm not going to even try to explain it, but pronation happens as a result of you being in the perfect um, trophy pose and then having all the force of your body and your hips turn properly, your angle of your trunk in the right place. And then as you're, as you're you know, going up to the serve, there's so much force that you're generating that pronation just happens naturally. And he's right. You know, and pronation happens from the way he explains it. Like it's this, he, it's called, he calls it something else. I don't know what it is, but, um, but yeah, I mean, it just depends on what you want to get out of your serve. If you're trying to hit the serve 100 miles an hour, you 1,000% have to pronate. Um, there's no way you can hit a serve um, super powerful consistently if you're slicing it, you know, and not ever getting that pop. Um, so it's a hard thing, you know. It's like because really, when you when you look at pronation in slow motion, the you know the rack. Hold on, let me get my racket. We're making a lot of broken strings. So if you know if you're serving, like the racket's gonna start like this and then ends like that. Yeah. Right. So it's that motion on the serve. Internal shoulder rotation, that's what it is. Thank you. Um, it's that motion that gets the pronation happening, and you see it's happening from my shoulder. That yeah, but see here it's happening from the shoulder, not up there, right? Yeah. So um so it's, you know, it's, uh, if you, so one way to work in pronation is tossing a ball, you know, like take a ball and try to make it hit the fence. I promise you 80% of the people listening to this cannot make the, the ball toss to the fence. Um, the first time you toss it is probably going to get to maybe the service line on the other side, depending on whether you're a man or a woman or how strong you are, but throw it high and, and into the fence, high and into the fence. And that starts to get you that sort of um, snap. Because if you don't snap, access internal rotation, yeah. If you don't snap, then um, you're not going to get it there. Yeah. Awesome you said that. Now, that's that's a – if you guys want to hear more about pronation and, and everything, then definitely on Friday tune in because I got to meet Gigi this year. We'll talk a lot about our lesson. Uh, I think we should do that tonight. Which I thought yeah. was a lot of fun. I think it turned out great. Is Mark and on this? Is it Mark on this? Mark, I actually, fun? I actually met Mark on Thursday, and we did a serve lesson. So, oh, great! He, he yeah. looked at Listen my serve on, yeah, yeah. He looked at my serve on video, and the way I explain it is, um, I am like the worst good athlete ever. I, I, I said this the other night on the call. When it came <laughs> to, you know, I was always 
pretty highly ranked in, in juniors. And then when it was like time to play kickball, uh, um, basketball, baseball, I literally felt I was one of the best in the school at, at all those things. But when right. it came time to test physical skills, like let's see how flexible you are, Pete. Let's see how good balance you have. Let's see this. I was literally one of the worst every time. Like I am. Oh, interesting. I'm a nightmare. Yeah. Like, so um, anyway, we, we went into reasons why my, why my serve is good and how it could improve and the physical limitations I have that are keeping me from making it, you know, even better. So I think you guys are going to like that, that video. And, um, you know, after watching the video, you'll probably think, well, gosh, if, if that's, if Pete can actually hit a decent ball, you know, then I really have a shot because he, he almost shouldn't even be allowed to drive a car when you see all my, how inflexible you are. Yeah. Oh, really? Everything. It's, 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 it's uh, incredible. Yeah. It's, it's really bad. So yeah. Anyway, that was pretty cool. All right. So um, let's talk about just a little bit more on this topic. And then we've already been on for 30 minutes. Let's, let's then kind of move to our lesson. I want people to, to kind of learn about our lesson. Uh, but let's talk about when you had a really bad day on the court um, you couldn't make a return or whatever, whatever would happen to you. Uh, what did you usually like to do? Like the next couple of days, did you like hit a million balls? Did you, uh, just, what do you just, mean the next day? You mean like right after the match? <laughs> oh, really? Okay. Oh, yeah. Tell us about if, that. Yeah. If, if I came off the court and something was way off, like way, I would go straight to the practice court. Like if I wasn't getting my serve in, I would go hit a basket of balls. If there was a blatant shot that I just could not make for whatever reason, I would definitely went straight to the practice court because you want to, you don't want to sleep on it, right? You don't want to, you don't want that to be the memory of, of, the, of your shot. Um, you know, and it can happen in a match I mean, you, you get tight in matches, you know, you're obviously a little tense, um, which you're not in necessarily in practice. Tension causes a lot of freaky things to happen to your body. Um, so then you can go to practice and see, okay, well, I'm not tense anymore. So now I can hit that shot again. So then you put that in your head again. Okay. So I have this shot. I just was missing it because I was tense and now I'm relaxed and I can hit it again. So then the key is not the shot. The key is you being not tight or loose when you're playing. Right. So, um, well, can that play into yeah. it even more? Can it be like, well, I can hit a forehand. I think that's what a lot of people struggle with. Look, I can hit this forehand. But then when a match comes, the forehand always turns into like a piece of rock. Like, can that get yeah. in your head too? Like, how do you work? Sure. That thing? Uh, well, so then you have then trigger words come in, right? Because if you're mm -hmm. if you're if you have the right thoughts, you know what, what I call the crave sequence, which is what you do with the twenty five seconds in between in between points. If you if you have those thoughts systemized too, which we have not spoken about your thoughts, how you make them systematic, also, then there's no time to be judgmental on your shots. Because in the in the 25 seconds in between points, you're going to take the first two or three seconds and just chill. Whether you won the po point or lost the point, you got to let that point go. No point has that much importance. The number one player in the world, whoever is number one at the time, Carlos Alcaraz right now, he number one player in the world wins 55 points, 55 percent of all the points they play. That means they're a loser 45 percent of the time. That's a high number and they're the best player in the world, right? So that applies to, to you listening. If you're the best 4-0 in your club, you're still going to lose 45% of the points. Um, so so not one point does not have that much importance. you got to let it go. The only point that really matters is match point, right? Mm -hmm. You lost a match. Every other point, it doesn't matter. It's just another point. Um, so that's, that's the first three seconds. You chill. Then you start your routines. You have to have the routines and your routines have to be specific. Like what do you do with your strings? You know, you're like fixing your strings. Where are your eyes? What are you doing with your outfit? Are you fixing your shirt? You know, Rafa Nadal is a master of that. Are you stepping on the lines? Not stepping on the lines. Um, while you're doing, walking around to pick up the balls, you're thinking of the last point. How did I win the point? How did I lose the point? Not how much I stink and how bad I played it, but I hit it to the forehand and she hit that one cross court. I maybe should hit a little bit deeper or maybe I should have attacked to the backhand or maybe I should be more patient or whatever it is. But it's the analysis of the point, right? It's not berating yourself or not winning the point. And then the, the next three or four seconds, then you have to decide what you're going to do in the next point. So now you go from, okay, that point's over. And now what am I going to do the next point? I'm going to serve, I'm going to come in, I'm going to return cross court down the line um lob get this you know get my first serve in three quarter pace whatever it is um you're analyzing that whoopsie 
What just happened? Uh oh. The lights went out. The lights went out in Georgia. Hey, Jane, can you do me a favor? Jane, you. She's not listening. All right. So I don't know what happened to my light, but um, so then the last thing, the last thing you do is you um, right after you've analyzed what you're going to do the next point, and then is then you use your trigger word, right? We just talked about earlier the trigger word. So then you go to your trigger word, right? So now you've had 20 seconds of not one moment to think about how bad you are or how you messed it up or blah, blah, blah. It was all a system in your head, right? So. Yeah. That oh, Ringo, you cannot be mad when you, when you, when you win a match, you can be mad. Really? <laughs> oh. oh, I feel sorry for you, Ringo. <laughs> You would have asked, listen, Brad Gilbert termed the phrase winning ugly. It does not matter how you win or lose or how you win, rather. It doesn't matter how you win. It doesn't matter how pretty it is or how ugly it is. A win's a win's a win's a win. So yeah. on to the next one. Ringo, tune in tomorrow night, too, because tomorrow, let me just go through this real quick while you guys are on. Tomorrow we have Jorge Capistani, Master USPTA and PTR Pro. Uh, and he's going to be talking about uh, five things you can do, five ways to get mentally tougher on the court. Wednesday, while well, Gigi, Gigi you, you work on fixing that, and I'll, I'll talk. Wednesday, um, we're going to have Dean Hollingworth at lunchtime, and he's going to be giving me a physical evaluation. Uh, he actually, I said, what should be the title? Because oh, I don't have it on my phone. But uh, anyway, it's going to be great because you're going to get to see all my shortcomings, and we'll see if – if he can actually give me some ideas on how to how to get better at some of my physical limitations. Yeah, I think it was like unlocking your physical limitations. That's what it is. Wednesday at lunchtime, unlocking your physical limitations. Then we'll have Maribon back and then we'll, we'll, we'll play some more trivia maybe on Thursday and, and Sunday. Uh, but we've got lots more live streams coming up. Gigi's got her light back on. So, so now that you got your light back on, oh, a couple of things too, guys. I'm going to put my email address in here. Um, you know, I sent out my email today on day one. It was a great day one. Uh, you know, thousands of people opened the email. Uh, thousands of people clicked on the email to get the content. But I also know that I got a lot of emails saying I did not get the day one email. So if you did not get the day one email and you are on this call right here, it could be something to do with my um, email service. I use something called Infusionsoft and then they communicate with like the Gmails and the yahoos and then i don't know how they decide but then they decide that you guys don't want my email when you do uh so that might be happening to you so you can um send me an email to crunch time coaching at gmail and i will personally hand deliver you the day one content so um that's just because i don't want you guys to miss it because a lot of great stuff so so Gigi, let's talk about what they're going to see from us on Wednesday. Cause I thought, I thought you had a pretty good topic this year. That was fun. Yeah. So, so basically on, on Wednesday, we're going to talk about all the blunders and mistakes that we saw from the doubles matches at, at the labor cup. Cause we had a lot of singles players playing doubles and there was a lot of positional errors, a lot of shot selection errors, a lot of coverage area, people going in the wrong place, getting the balls that went, weren't theirs. Um, so this might be encouraging, right? Because these are pros, right? <laughs> and they're still, um, not really under, some of them were not really understanding how to play the game of doubles and, um, or not understanding what shot they should be hitting or where, what should they be covering. So, so we kind of pick it apart. Um, there was three great doubles matches this year at the Labor Cup, um, all included Jack Sock, who's the only true doubles player out there. And, uh, you will see that he generally dominates those matches um, at the Labor Cup. So, yeah, it was fun. And then we got to meet in person because my daughter was playing in a soccer tournament in, in Atlanta. So I, we, Pete was nice to drive through my hotel and uh, we kind of um, went through all that. It was super fun. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. And then we, we took the points. We analyzed the points. We're going to show you guys. We're going to break down the exact moment. Rafi Nadal makes the wrong move and, and <laughs> Roger Federer stay in the wrong serve position. And, all these amazing players that we that I can't get a point off of for sure. You know, we get to we get to you know, oh, what are they doing? So it's pretty cool. But it, it's definitely gonna. And what I look at, like you talked about, so many of the servers stay in the wrong position to serve. 
But I point out, man, well, Federer could still get there. But if, if recreational players, are, I think if you guys are staying in the wrong spot, it, it ex, it's more than more, you're exploited more because you don't have the fast reactions to make up for it that they do. You know, they can be in a wrong spot and then, you know, still get there sometimes where if we move to the wrong spot, our opponents see the ball coming in slower. They can see us in the wrong spot. They can measure it as the ball is coming in and then really yeah. pick you apart, right? Wouldn't, wouldn't you say yeah. that's true? Absolutely. And you don't want to start pointing behind the eight ball, right? And you don't want to start point already in trouble because you're positioned in the wrong place. Yeah. So 100%, um, there was a lot of fun. Fun banter going on and a lot of uh, – we probably could have found more points, but we got about eight or ten points there. Well, yeah, I mean the, the video, the video yeah. I know you wanted to keep going, which which I was thrilled, uh, and then we, we did a little more. Well, you know, but... I, was, I was watching the matches live, and what I'm going to do next year at the Labor Cup is when something happens, I'm going to note the score, right, because then I can go back. And, but I found – I couldn't find the, the matches. I couldn't find the entire match of doubles. Uh, for the labor cop, like I, I don't, it was not anywhere that I could see. So we were just kind of relying on whatever highlights uh, someone had put up on on YouTube. Um, yeah. So I think we'll do it again next year. I think this is a good subject. I loved it. Um, so here's a question from Nancy, and the the answer is no, Nancy. You make sure you're on my email list. Uh, Gigi, will you send the email out with a link tomorrow? I am the one who sends the link. I am the link gatekeeper. So if there's something, if there's some reason why you are not getting day two link, if you're not getting Tuesday's lessons, which I will show you, we're about to go into what you're going to see tomorrow. If you don't get that email from me by nine o'clock, email me. That's why I put my email out there. Crunch time coaching at Gmail. If you're not getting your, your emails, don't bother any of the other tennis con all-stars bother me. Okay. And I will make sure that you get your lesson. I was on the phone with people all day today. I was emailing people. I was putting out fires all day, GG. But you know what? I'm actually, sure. It's actually, it's actually fun. Um, you guys okay. have no idea. Everybody listening, you have no idea how much work it is to put these things together. And Pete, I have to commend you on doing an amazing job because it is a lot of work to get all these, you know, athletes and coaches and players to come on and, um, spend an hour and then not, that's just the easy part right then you got to edit it you got to upload it you got it's like endless the email sequences it's a lot of work that's why i don't do it anymore <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Gigi said, i'm done with the whole thing come i'm to done my with camp. the online thing but yeah. um yeah but yeah, I, 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 love, I love doing it and it's, I it's fun I look, and you're good at it you did yeah. a great job editing that video it's great yeah, thank you so much but i definitely yeah. don't count hours when you do this because then you're right you'd be like what am i doing but um but to me it's it's all worth it so what i'm gonna do guys i'm gonna share the screen um and then i'm gonna show you tuesday what you can expect tomorrow and again you'll be getting the email from between eight and nine i know a lot of you got it. a lot of you cook the link so a lot of you are getting it but some of you are also not getting it but this is what we'll have to look for tomorrow. I'm just going to wait for us to shrink. Is it going to? It seems like it's delayed. Ooh, what's the, who's the best of a player regular? among the three? There we three? go. Huh. <laughs> Good question. Okay. Now here's Tuesday, guys. So the first one, because I, I like uh, I like all these like little stories from Top Court. Uh, Gigi, did you ever do a one with Top Court? I did. Yeah, how about Top Court? Um, that's right. Uh, I, I gotta get your, I gotta get your top court lesson in there. So this is uh, an, an encore performance from last year. You can see Layla Fernandez uh, there, but a lot of great lessons there. Uh, but then we get into, I really like this, this video. Um, have you watched a top tennis train much, Gigi? Do you know who they are? No. Wait, top, who is okay. it? Top tennis top training, tennis. Alex and Simon. No. Okay. Well, actually, there's a great video Alex has put on when he he warmed up better all in the year end championships like four or five years ago. He was, he was his warm up partner. So, cool. and he played. I think he played three out of the four majors. Simon's also an amazing player, uh, and Simon coaches so much. Their YouTube channel is huge. They have like over three hundred thousand subscribers, and now Simon's going back in the in his mid thirties playing on the ITF uh, circuit again, and he's actually doing pretty well. And uh, really? so he made. When you have a limited time, 
uh, how to how to do that. This is uh, actually I got to change this title. So, but this is um, how to practice. This is how to practice um, when you have a limited time to do it, and and it's a great great video. Uh, Simon shows you how you get everything in, get a groove, work on every stroke, kind of what Gigi was talking about tonight, and, and then also practice some pressure. Uh, next one, this is another practice video from John Craig, who's a USPTA elite professional, and this is another great thorough one. And this is this is how you can practice by yourself. This is everything you can do by yourself, which I thought was excellent. And then he has another one, how to build a professional quality serve motion. And yeah, I don't know if you ever watched John, but he is he's very, very uh, thorough with his lessons, very step by step. Then we've got uh, Ellis Ferrer played on the team. Remember him? He played with uh, Rick. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So he was actually talking in this one how, you know, by transforming his forehand today, he says, he says, my forehand today, he says, is better than his forehand when it goes on the pro tour because of the new little tips he's learned. So he goes through that. Uh, then you got Scott and Nate from Play Your Court, and they are talking about how to have serve acceleration, racket head speed, give you lots of great drills to do. Very professionally made video um, and lots of drills. Very good. It's right from their serve course. This guy is awesome right here. Uh, he's actually started to train. Um, I think the guy's name is Felix from the tennis brothers and Felix is trying to get an ATP point on tour. They're from England. And this tennis mentor is quite a coach. And he, he talks about when to drive and when to slice your backhand. So the right time to hit it, the right time to chip it. Be interested to get your point of view on that here in a second, Gigi. Uh, Peter Becker talking about all the different grips on the forehand and how to use them and how the stroke changes a little bit and the contact point changes a little bit. So you can kind of decide what grip you think best suits your game and your swing and how you should develop your swing path. Uh, this is a great one from online tennis instruction, which kind of teaches you that famous Federer lag and snap forehand. Again, takes you from a closed to an open practice environment. This guy who is teaching here is obviously, I think, looks like he's trying to make it on the tour. He's pretty darn good. Very high quality player. And they bring it through some great drills. Uh, Tom, Tom Alsop, who's going through uh, how to develop, again, your serve. So lots of serve stuff because many of you wrote in and said, I have a weak serve. So we wanted to put a lot of serves in. And then we got Maribon talking about the five singles mistakes. We showed you this last night. And then finally, uh, did you ever run against um, Micah Babel? She was top 30 in the world. Did you ever see her? Gigi? Is Gigi there? I got muted. Yeah, I definitely know. I definitely know Micah. She was contemporary. Very, okay. very successful. Yeah. Beautiful one hand and backhand. This is also yeah. an encore performance. So, Again, how does this work? If you've got your free pass, you get to enjoy this for 48 hours. Uh, and then and then it will It's a lot of expire. information. That's awesome. It's a lot, it's of, information. lot of information, right? It's great. It, How much are you charging yeah, for this? Tea? You're probably not charging enough. How much are you charging for this? Well, when they first sign up, they've got uh, 25 minutes to get at 67, but then it jumps up to 97. And it's, you know, the price of one cheap still, tennis racket. I mean, it's still all this information for 90 bucks. Are you kidding me? Charge triple that. <laughs> I, I, I believe so, too. Um, so, yeah. So, anyway, when you guys upgrade, um, so if, if you if you go and you get my emails and you decide to upgrade this week, remember, you got 48 hours access to each day. But you get at lifetime access if you want to, and you, you get all the lessons. You also get all the audios. We're working on that. Probably all the audio, audios will be inside the membership next, sometime next week. This I'm very proud of. It's the VIP coaching hotline. So for 30 days, you can ask me questions about lessons. You can ask me in, in text, video, audio, and you can even put your um, – videos of yourself serving or hit a forehand or backhand. I see some people already, already asking me questions and playing some video, which I'll get to next week. So you get to do that for 30 days. I have that as a 597 value. And if you take advantage of it, like Tom Nordstrom, you're, you're literally just robbing me blind. So um, then I also made how to win big at your level 
in singles from a 3-0 to a 3-5 to a 4-0 to 4-5 because I was thinking, you know, sometimes these tips, they're great tips, but sometimes maybe they're they're too vanilla to where it's like, okay, maybe if you're a 3-0, you, sh- you don't need to be working on a Roger Federer forehand to win at 3-0. You should be working on something else. And, and I show you what it takes to win at that level and then what you need to work on to get to the next level. So it's it's making the big move to the next level or winning at your level, singles, doubles, addition. So you get all this, like Gigi said, for just uh, a payment of $97. Why this week is lasting, this promotional week. Then it jumps up to $197. Then I really just don't even – I kind of just tuck it away. Um, and you don't really get opportunities to even get it. So, yeah. So please support the conference and upgrade to Lifetime. Oh, that uh, oh, keeps it going. So, Pete, we, I just want to tell – I want to get a feel for what people think about this. Because before this call started – I came up with this idea to you about having TennisCon live, right? Like BravoCon yeah. live just went on TennisCon live. Like would people want to do this in in a you know resort environment and then actually play tennis and work on these things they're learning? And I'm wondering how people would feel about that. Did you guys get that? So Gigi and I just, I mean, we just literally just spitballed this idea. What do you think if we did a TennisCon live to where it'd be a different time of the year and you guys would come on out and we would coach you and you get to play matches and we'd eat together and hang out. That's kind of the idea, right, Gigi? Yeah, and have some, you know, obviously you're not going to have all these speakers there, all 50 of them, but you could have, you know, a handful, 10, 15, however many we can get. A um, little bit like the double summit that I do, but more, but more specific, the double summit is just only doubles, right? It's you're learning doubles for four days. Um, the... This would be like all oh, everything that you do here, like the mental, the technique, the strokes, the you know how to practice, like all the other things. Um, I think there's something there, maybe. I think so too. Tennis con live. Grace says, "I love I love tennis con live." Grace says, "Grace, Jamie, Grace Jamie is coming to the Bryant's camp. Together. I just let her in." <laughs> oh, awesome! Yeah. yeah. And uh, so, yeah, so you're getting a lot of dogs. I love clinics and recommend to all. Dottie's been to my clinics, Lots yes. of GD. Yeah. The Bryan Brothers Clinic is going to be amazing. Too bad it's happening midweek, dying to attend. Yeah, if you guys also want to go to any of Gigi's camps, make sure that you, you know, uh, go to her website, and email her, and all kinds of cool stuff like that. Uh, John Craig is on, who is one of our tennis conference professors presenters says i cover this exclusively in my presentation so i think maybe he's talking about pronation um oh yes thank you uh you gotta what about the slinger bag yeah so when you guys when you guys signed up you guys entered a raffle so just by sign up you're automatically entered into a raffle one of you will win a slinger bag which is like 800 bucks and then another one is going to win a total tennis makeover from Tennis Express. Yeah, racket, bag, you know, the works. And I'm going to be making this announcement on Sunday night. I'm going to basically be doing a raffle. I'll have the winners picked, and I'm going to announce it on Sunday night. So make sure you stay tuned for the whole entire conference, and you will find out on Sunday night if you won a slinger bag, uh, or a total test maker, or what if you won both? That would be amazing. I don't. I don't think that that's probably not that. If I don't think I'd let someone win both. But anyway, <laughs> yeah. I just basically, I'm going to have this raffle machine that I'm basically going to run all the names through and pick a winner. That's how I did it last year, and the stuff and loved it. Uh, okay, we have W H saying I love the idea of us doing a camp. Yeah. So people are saying they love TCon Live, GG. So. Gigi, tell people what you're, what, where you're, and what you've named it. I thought that was pretty cool. What TennisCon Live? No, TennisCon Live. But where, where are you? You just took a new position. Oh well, that's and... not official, but but it is on the video in two days. Uh, um, yeah, you did um, put on the video. Yeah, I, you, I did Should put on talk? the video. I just don't have. No? Yeah, we can talk about it. I I accepted the position of um, touring pro at the Innisbrook Resort, which is here in Tampa, where I've been doing my camps. Um, Joe Mattingly, the director, left six months ago, and they were having um, 
not success finding a replacement. So they approached me about being the touring pro, which I am, and uh, we hired a director of tennis who will run day-to-day -day operations. But basically I'm there, you know, and I'm, the good news is that, you know, before I was, I was limited to doing like one camp, you know, maybe six camps a year, one camp a month, um, because I was not on staff, right? Or I was not part of uh, the Innisport employee. Um, but now I can do camps all the time. So if anybody wants to come, we have a camp. We're just going to constantly be running camps. We want it to be the home of doubles, the, the place to go in Florida or in the United States if you want to get better at doubles. There's not really another place that I know of that spoke that focuses specifically on doubles. I mean, there's Saddlebrook and um, IMG Academies, and there's um, doubles camps in Jacksonville, and there's Newcomb's Ranch, and there's a lot of different places to go learn tennis, but there's not anybody really focusing on doubles. So, so now I have a home, so I'm super excited about that. And, um, and I am not playing at the World Pickleball Open because I am in Louisiana doing 2G Method Clinics, one in New Orleans and one in Shreveport. Um, because I still want to hit all 50 states and I'm only 33 and I have 17 more to go. So um, I'm going to check off Louisiana and that's when I'm going to be there. So I'm not playing pickleball tournament. I love, and I love it. I'm that's having a hard doubles. time finding was... pickleball partners. Go ahead. Try it. I, I just love that you doubles, your yeah. name at the home of doubles. I thought that was such a great yeah. name and so perfect. Well, that, that has to get approved, but <laughs> you keep it in this well, little conversation. That we're how having. can, yeah. How can they turn that down? Well, I don't know. That's yeah. a great so name. Is a, it's a big, big company. Like it's part of Salamander properties. I know. Uh, That's what I hate. Into, yeah. So I think it'll work, but you know, I still have to start. I haven't started yet. We started mid November. So, so you heard it here first, and if you're the, on my list, you'll get to know to about it. it even, even if it's not officially called that, if Gigi's teaching right. there, it's the freaking home of doubles. Okay, <laughs> you're, you're not going to go. You're not going to go anywhere else and get a set. You know, a, a doubles clinic from a 17-time Grand Slam champion, and then have all these others. Well, there's there's only one champions. other one. There's only one other 17-time Grand Slam champion, and she's in Belarus. So you're probably yes. not going to do it there. And she's not teaching any tennis camp anytime soon. We interviewed her, no, Gigi, and she's no. not so crazy. And there's about Mike and Bob. Camp. Yes, Mike and Bob have 17 grand sums. I was talking yeah. on the female side. So, but they come and they help you too. So, I mean, it's yeah. So anyway, well, guys, so, that's pretty much uh, all we have for you tonight. It's an hour with with uh, the Grand Slam champion here. I'm putting my link in there uh, just to make it easy. If you decide that you did want to upgrade. And get lifetime access if you feel like, wow, this is a really good call and uh, this is a lot of great stuff. And you want to watch it over and over again because I'm going to put all the live stream calls. Because I find the live stream calls are also very good. It, over the next week, I'm also going to be adding like this call. And people really love Jeff's call. Uh, and then, you know, we're going to have Jorge on tomorrow. And Dean Hollingworth is going to give me a, a, a skills test on my physical abilities. So like all these things are going to go also inside of the membership. And one of my pitches to you guys, which is absolutely true, is that you can watch these videos and go, that's a really great lesson. But there's studies that's called the forgetting curve. Uh, this guy Ebbinghaus did it. And he discovered that people forget 95% of what they learn in a day, like two days later. But through space repetition, if you watch something that you really are attracted to and go, okay, I, got, I really want to learn this. If you watch that same thing a couple of days later, then a week later, and then like a month later, and then one time after that. It's a total of five times. If you watch something five times, then you can actually retain 95% of what you learn. And that just makes sense. I mean, it's just like if you just hit one forehand, you'll be like, okay, that's a forehand. I get it. But in order to get it, you got to really hit like that forehand where you actually get it. So make sure you get Tennis Con 6. That's the end of my soap, opera, soap speech. Gigi, anything else we should um, say before we leave? We lost her. She's mute. I have two spots left in Brian's camp and about six spots left in Indian Wells camps. Um, hi, John. John's coming to the Brian's camp. Um, so I need a 3-5 guy and a 4-5 person for Brian camps. And then uh, Indian Wells have three, five, four oh spots left. And those are super fun. Uh, Indian Wells, obviously the Brian brothers are super fun because they're super fun. 
Uh, and then Indian Wells, we go to the tournament for three days. So that's kind of fun too. So awesome. Very cool. All right. Very cool. Yeah. I love it. That, that, this was a great time. Thank you so much, Gigi. Yeah. If you guys are interested in going to one of our camps, definitely make sure you get in contact with Gigi. I'm sure she'd love to have you out. My website, put my and, website yeah, in there, gfanlistennis.com. I'm going to type it in right now. You know what? I'm going to put, can I make a banner real quick? Hold on guys. I'm going to make a banner. This is, uh, this is putting me under pressure, GG. I'm not good at this pressure stuff, but I'm going to try and make a special banner for you. GG, is it GG Fernandez tennis? Yeah. Dot com. Okay. Yeah. GG Fernandez tennis.com add banner. And then I'm going to pop it. Let's see. Is it in there? It's, it's creating. Did it create banners? I don't see it. Oh, I'm sorry. Don't worry. Gigi. G Gigi Fernandez tennis.com. Right. Who can yeah. forget that? You can put Gigi Fernandez too. And it goes no, I, also to that page. Yeah. I, I, I made it in for reasons that didn't work. Didn't, didn't stick. I wanted to put it right no there, worries. but yeah, go Gigi Fernandez tennis.com. Uh, thank you so much, Gigi. Everybody have a great night. Be ready tomorrow between 8 and 9 a.m. for my email, Eastern Time. If you don't get it, email me at crunchtimecoaching at gmail. I do have that banner already. So make sure you email me right there. If you're not getting your email in the morning, I am sending it, guys. Believe me. I didn't. This is not a prank I'm pulling to where I have everybody sign up and then don't send the information. So there's something going on with, with our email services not communicating, uh, which I don't quite understand. But um, I'll make sure you get it. That's it. Everybody have a great night. And uh, we'll see you uh, tomorrow night at 8 o'clock with Jorge Capistani. Bye. Thank you.